Hey there, this is Alex Soth, and I'm back in my library for another rambling talk. Um, before starting, I, uh, I just wanted to share that I've been thinking about uh, these videos so much and trying to upgrade them and make the quality better, and, uh, the video and the audio better. And, um, and I thought, I'm putting so much time in this, maybe I should try to get some sort of sponsorship or something. Um, so I reached out to a camera company because I was in the market for a new camera and, um, and then they declined me. So, um, so I decided, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to sponsor myself and do a little, a little ad here for myself first. So, um, I'm going to start this vlog with a little infomercial just about my lecturing um, because uh, in normal times I do a lot of visiting artist lectures and I've worked really hard over the years to make these lectures a bit more um, dynamic. One of the things I did is um, I created this this list right here of mini lectures and prepared these so that I could spin the wheel live and come up with a subject to talk about. Um, and then more recently, I've worked on this way of doing lectures that involve the physical objects. So this is the this is a picture of um, my first lecture like this. This was at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. This was a very rudimentary system that I used. Um, it, kind of, it, it was very crash prone and whatnot. Um, and, and I've since updated this a lot uh, for my collaboration with Dave King uh, with the Palms so that it's um, just higher quality all around. Uh, and that's what I'm using here and, and continue adapting for these talks. But um, I do uh, I do like doing lectures a lot. And, um, and I've used this new setup for lectures in Japan and Texas uh, this year. And, um, and I want to do more of that. So if you're interested, uh, contact my studio at alexoth.com. So back to this, <laughs> the topic at hand, which is uh, pictures and foreign words. Uh, another one in this series of talking about words and pictures. What happened um, last week is I was looking for Flypaper of Life, that Roy DiCarava book, and and I, I found um, this book by Carl Johan de Geer. And it was just, it was right next to the De Carava. And, and I was thinking about, uh, this book was published in 1970. And, 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 and I've, always, uh, I've always loved looking at it, uh, particularly like some of these drawn elements. And, and this is obviously a book that profoundly incorporates text. But I don't read Swedish. <laughs> And, uh, and I have no idea what it says. Um, you know, all I know is that this means uh, money or life. And, and I just sort of experienced this book as a totality. Uh, and, and somehow in thinking about that, I thought about all of the Japanese books that I have. And so many of them uh, if they have text, I can't read it. And, and to me, they're sort of textless. So in thinking about this, um, relationship <clears throat> between pictures and words, as Japanese photography in my mind represents kind of wordless photography. So this got me looking at the provoke, uh, photographers. So this is a, a facsimile of the first issue of 
Provoke magazine, uh, published in 1968. And Provoke number one famously starts with this text over here, which of course I can't read, but it's been translated many times. This is the uh, this is an excellent book on Provoke and um, super comprehensive. And back here is a translation of that text. I'm just going to pull out one sentence or two. It says, um, today at this very moment, language is losing its material basis. In other words, its reality and floating in space. We as photographers must capture with our own eyes fragments of reality that can no longer be grasped through existing language and must actively put forth materials that address language and ideas. So Provoke from the very beginning was dealing with language and was, was kind of reacting uh, in some ways against words. Um, a couple of the Provoke members were poets and, and it, it's, it's almost like, a, it's almost like a, a antithesis to poetry in some ways or just a, a different language uh, altogether. And in posting my first two videos on pictures and words, there were, you know, understandably some comments. Why do why do photographs have to be attached to words? And um, and this school of photography always seemed linked to that concept for me. Um, but in fact, words are at the very heart of the idea of provoke in some ways. Um, probably the the book that best represents this wordlessness uh, and and kind of the irony of it is is this book um, which okay we can't read this in the West um, I can't read this and it's uh, it's bye bye photography by Dido Morama now, I know that this is by by photography, uh, but is it actually? I mean, a translation, right, can can mean something else. I mean, I've also heard it called by by photography, dear, and and that's something that I think about with language, is how specific it is, and how the the feeling of by by photography means one thing to me in English, and I have no idea if it means the same thing in Japanese. And, and I say all of this because this is a, a book, a wordless book, but it's actually literally wrapped in words. And it's interesting to, to think about that, that you're entering this book with language. But in fact, when you open it up and, and start looking at it, um, well, there's the title page, we enter a realm that where language does struggle. You know, if, if, if I try to describe what I'm looking at here, uh, you know, it appears to be a uh, maybe, yeah, it's a blurry figure. You see an arm here. Uh, I have no idea what this is. Um, here we're uh, we're looking out a window from a train, probably, and you see two frames and some wires up here, which suggests a train, but it's barely recognizable. Uh, this looks like it's it's probably a bra and an underarm. And maybe this is a detail of the bra, but um, fish, some sort of crowd scene. A baby sleeping, but but the you know I'm using words here, but it's difficult to make it out. It's um, it's pretty abstract and pretty language-less, uh, kind of resists it. If I, you know, 
if I try to go around the picture and describe every element, it's, it's challenging. Uh, you know, a very abstracted version of a newspaper, very abstract feeling of a dog and a sidewalk, but it's all kind of blurred together. So, so I think of this as wordless photography, but, but then if, if you go to the back of the book, you see text, lots and lots of text. Uh, I think this is all an interview with Dido Moriyama, but, uh, but I'm not entirely sure. And, and obviously the, the title Bye Bye Photography hugely influences the way we read this book. It's, it's maybe one of the most, uh, famous titles, uh, for a book ever published. So I was thinking about that and, um, and it's, a, I should say that it's a book that I respect, you know, enormously, but it never moved me for whatever reason. Um, I think because maybe I, because I'm, uh, you know, from a different generation and, and that kind of style was appropriated and became part of like, you know, MTV culture. Uh, I, I experience it more as a style and less as uh, a revolution. And, and so in some ways um, I've been drawn more to uh, uh, certain contemporary Japanese photographers and, but also this, this issue of words comes into play. So this is a book by Masafumi Sanai, uh, published in 1998. And the title is here and, uh, and it's, I don't know. Um, and, and that's like a, who's on first jo joke, but, um, I, th the actual title of the book is, I don't know. Um, but I, you know, when I look for this book, I forget that that's the title. Um, and I, it's, it's, it's always a problem with my library finding certain Japanese books. Cause I can, I sometimes can't remember anything about them except how they look. And so this book actually starts with a bunch of text and you know now we have these tools like google translate so i'm gonna um so what i'm gonna do here is okay so now i'm going to translate this and it says um Let's see, um, I bought the car in January of this year and it was snowing on the day of delivery. The model is Mark 271 sedan, pearl two-tone automatic transmission, power steering, power window, full normal, 80,000 yen. I thought it was this. I made it shiny every day and got on. Cass got sick uh, from last month and bought the latest one. I thought this was it. I love listening to music in the car, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, according to the clerk, it's really amazing. Uh, so this is about uh, his buying of a new car. And is that text important? I, you know, I think it is because of the sort of diary-like nature of it and, and the enthusiasm with which he talks about it. So this book is too wide uh, for for my camera here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on one page and then, and then show you the other. Okay. Look at this. Okay. So here's some English text, really funny. Uh, <clears throat> I love this. It's like, uh, it looks like maybe the fabric on, on the interior of a car.
And so another thing that I think about that's linked to language is simply cultural experience. So this Toyota Mark II, I'm certain means something in Japan. It evokes a certain time period, a certain class, um, a certain region. I, I'm not sure, but I know how I feel about. So you know, I can read cars in the U.S. like I can read people's clothing, and and that is you know that kind of cultural specificity is is a cousin to language specificity. So not being able to read the words in a book is is not that different from not being able to fully read some of the cultural meaning embedded in the photographs. But that's okay because for me, so much of photography is about um, this, this kind of openness and this making of my own story. Of course, that suits this kind of lyrical type uh, photo book project. So this is interesting. On, on this page here, this image, and this one, this kind of relates to um, uh, a, a photo book effect of, of shifting time slightly that I talked about in a previous video. So this book is, um, it, it, it's such a contrast to Moriyama. The Provoke artists were in some ways re rebelling against uh, the, the kind of um, consumerism that was happening. And, and this book by Sinai is, it, is sort of, uh, it's all about a kind of uh, slacker, consumerism. I really love this photograph here. Uh, so a lot of these pictures are snowy. Um, are they taken in the north of Japan? You know, I don't really know. So one thing about these photographs is that they have a strong color cast, often in the yellowish side. Um, with, they feel very filmy. Uh, they, they, they have that kind of creaminess of film, which, which to me, um, which actually suits this, this kind of the vintage appeal of the old car. Um, And my thought is that Masafumi Sanai has this car and he's, he's driving around Japan, uh, taking in the landscape, but enjoying his car. And then there's this just incredible spread and, and this layout, which is so funny and wonderful. This book is, it has these delightful surprises in it. Okay, here's some more text. And, and so this is the thing. For, with this book, I've looked at it many times without reading this text. So let's, let's read it in, in you know, I'll read a translation of it and see if it contributes to the meaning of the book. Let's see here. Okay, so this says, when I woke up this morning, there were six boxes of seven stars. About three boxes are common, but six boxes are quite rare. I don't know what that means. I did a little kin show, but don't worry too much. So, so far, I don't understand anything. 
I had a mysterious dream until a while ago. I was driving on the highway. There was a forehead made of old wood in the passenger seat, and it was full of water droplets. I knew something was strange, but I decided to touch it. After all, it was a swim ring. I want to go to the sea. Good night. <laughs> so that's obviously like not a perfect translation, but I think you get this, the spirit of this, this kind of dreaminess, this driving around in a dream state. Uh, I think that suits the book very well. And I, I, yeah, I like, I like the feeling of this text. I even like the, the bad Google translation. So here are these, these sleeping dogs. You can see how this final section becomes this sort of this sort of dreamlike passage to end the book. Look at this. And this this feels very much like a, a scene in a dream. So then you have this flash lit interior full of video cassettes this kind of uh, hipster den and then this night scene i love this book so much um so there you have it so yeah so this is a book in which uh Language has never played uh, much of a role for me, but when I use language, it, it and when I read the text as best I can, it only makes it richer to me. So another book I want to show is this one. Uh, it's called Utatane by Rinko Kawuchi. Uh, again, that information is not is not on the cover. Um, I think this is this very beat up band is um, is related to some sort of prize, and yeah. So an utatane, I looked it up, and it means napping. Um, so kind of like Masafumi Sanai, this sort of this dreamy quality. I'm going to come in a little bit closer here. And Rinko Kawuchi, more than almost anyone I can think of, takes, uh, takes me into this sort of dream state. I always think of her as having the eyes of a baby, kind of seeing the world anew, eyes like really wide open, these big circles. And, and in that, in a baby sort of way, not strongly attaching seeing to language. And a beautiful thing about, about her work in this book in particular is the form of the circle. Uh, she, you know, she shoots in a square, which is the most you know, circular-like format, and, um, and you'll just see lots of circles repeated. And this, this relates to the video I did about Eggleston's Democratic Forest, because Eggleston uh, talked about wanting to view the world uh, like a bird almost, and, uh, or an animal going low and going high. And she really does that. Uh, she's moving around. She's looking way up. She's looking way down. One, I, I love this book so much, but one thing that happens with the sequencing is there often there's a kind of pairing that happens on the on the two pages, um, which sometimes to me feels a little too matchy matchy. Um, you know, this this would be an example. Um, I, I I think both pictures are such 
Kauchi images, um, but the the repetition of the circles is a bit too obvious for me. Same here. And I, I just love, uh, I mean, I love that this, this industrial image, which is not, it doesn't have that soft gaze of, of our other pictures and then match with this, uh, this bizarre photograph of a, of a, um, one of those eye holes and a door, but you don't have the context of the door. So it's very hard to make out. And so this book really is, uh, I, I look at it and and I'm more in a in that kind of napping dream state where I'm just softly looking. Uh, this is an interesting moment where you have this this blurry picture on a subway. It's not you know a, a great picture. It's not supposed to be a great picture. And then I love this. We flip the page and we're presented with two more versions of it. And why this? And this has that uh, democratic forest, like questioning, why this? Are we looking, you know, at this briefcase up here? Um, but I love it because it's, you can just imagine her riding the subway and looking up and taking things in. And I feel, you know, I feel that I'm moving through the world with her eyes. This pairing to me is so strong. Looking down, looking up. You can imagine the girl on the left looking down at this fish. She's, you know, it's what I like is that this isn't overly paired because it's such obviously different times of day, but we make uh, a kind of connection between that girl's, uh, the direction of her gaze and the fish as though they're looking at each other. Okay. So this book has no text in the back and, and it ex exists mostly in a, uh, in a wordless space. So the last book I want to talk about was recently published and and it's called Kisa by Kisa, or Kisa by Kisa. I'm not sure how you pronounce this. Uh, it's, it's made by an American photographer named Craig Maud, who uh, lives in Japan. And, uh, and this is a book that is full of text. Um, Craig Maud is a writer. And, um, and, when this book arrived, I'll confess I was wary of it. I thought, oh God, all these words. And, and the photographer wrote all the words and it's going to be, it's going to be dreary to go through it. Um, but in fact, it's fantastic. Uh, I, I really like this book a lot and it's, and it's funny because it's um, it's not exactly, in my mind, a photography book. Um, if I were to categorize this in a bookshop, it could be easily put in the uh, in the food section. It could be put in the travel section. Uh, it could be if there's a section on walking and exercise, it could be there. 
because basically uh, what Ma did is he walked across Japan looking for these uh, special restaurants that serve this kind of uh, cheese toast, which is sort of like pizza, uh, but not exactly. And, and I don't look at this book, uh, I, I don't judge it in the same way. I don't go into the same headspace that I go into uh, Rinko Kawuchi's book. Um, because it has more of a narrative structure. Ma tells stories about these restaurants. And what's interesting is that if I, uh, if I saw, let me, let me show an example of one of these restaurants. Yeah, so here, here's one. I'll zoom in. So if I went to Japan and I saw this place, I would make a, a kind of association to a certain kind of American coffee shop, I guess. Um, but I think, you know, and, and Maude explains this in his text. He explains what it means culturally to the Japanese, the feeling that it evokes. And because very often when he was walking across Japan, going to these places, uh, the people he encountered were bewildered. Why would he be interested in them? Uh, and and I and he takes us into the cultural significance. He essentially translates both uh, the language and the photographs, and we we see Japan, you know, through the eyes of a Westerner, but one who but one who has uh, a lot of cultural knowledge. So it's a, it's a lovely book and, and an example of text and image working together. Um, it's also self-published, which is interesting. So Craig Maud uh, has a very popular newsletter and, uh, and, and one of which is free and one of which is uh, you can uh, pay for, and and the funds from that paid for the production of this book, which is an interesting model. And uh, you know, as as I venture into this strange world of YouTube and um, and the kind of do-it-yourself aesthetic, I you know I really admire people who take chances and find new paths like that. So. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk and I will see you next time. Thanks so much.